I do believe that the chapter of Kosovo's long struggle for independence and nationhood is on the verge of being successful. I will do everything in my power as chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee to lubricate the process. I want to thank uh, uh, my distinguished colleagues who are there who have done so much to move this process forward. It has been a totally bipartisan effort. And before I sit down, I want to pay a special tribute to my good friend and former colleague, uh, the recent uh, chairman of the committee, Henry Hyde, who along with Ben Gilman uh, played an absolutely critical role in bringing us to this point. Thank you very much. Albania, a year before he passed away. 
and they come running up to me and say, what is your father's name? What is he doing speaking all day? I said, well, I can tell you that when he came here in 1929, he spoke two languages, and one of them was in English. I would think he had Italian. And you might say, well, how did that happen? It's amazing that we in America don't really learn Eastern European history that much. And what it is is that, you know, the Turks were set on overrunning Europe in the 14th and 15th century. And Albania bore the brunt of it. There was a great Albanian general, his name was George Castriani, and he fought the Ottoman Turks for 27 years, 20 battles, outnumbering some of them 200,000 to 10,000. He was a genius. You don't know about him here, Europe knows about him. He has a statue in Budapest, Vienna, and Rome. But they held the Turks back, but then when he died of pneumonia in 1968, his son could not do the same. And 20 years later, the year was 1488, Albania fell. Tens of thousands of Albanians streamed across the Adriatic only 45 miles to Italy. If you look at the map, Italy is only 45 miles from Albania at the closest point, the Straits of Utrecht. So today in Italy, my wife and I wrote National Geographic there in 1999, I couldn't believe it, you have 51 Albanian-speaking villages today in southern Italy. My father happens to be the one closest to Naples, it's called Greci. Now why would an Albanian village be called Greci, which means Greek? Because the first millennium, all of southern Italy was controlled by Greeks. In fact, Naples, what is its real name? Neapolis, the new city. And this village was a gift by the king of Naples. Italy was not formed until 1861. The king of Naples, which included Sicily, was given to the soldiers of George Castriani for saving Italy from a French invasion in the year 1461. Would you believe it? I mean, this is incredible history. So here, my father, comes from one of the 2,000 soldiers that George Castriani left as security for the Kingdom of Naples in the year 1461. And since he died in 1468, and the Turks overran Albania, they could never go back. So my father's people were stranded in Italy, and then many others came in the year 1488. Well, that's the beginning. So when I heard this group of Albanians running towards me and talking about you know, how's your father speaking Albanian? I said, well, I know there's this subculture in Italy, and it may go back to uh, something about the Turks. I didn't know. My father didn't have the education. They tell me. He said, no, you are from Kosovo. You came from what was Albania, but really Kosovo, and we need you. I said, what's Kosovo? I've never heard of Kosovo. And I get to Congress, and I start checking with Congressman. The only one who knew Kosovo was Congressman Lantos, who was born in Hungary. And it was always a great coalition with the Hungarians and the Albanians as freedom fighters against the uh, Ottoman Turks. In fact, you told me that a uh, contemporary of George Castriani was the great Hunyadi, youngest Hunyadi, the freedom fighter at that time. Well, that's history. We're not going to decide anything based on history. As you know, we have to give America more than just a few casinos back to the back to Indians. We're not going to do that. We have to deal with current reality. And going to current reality, what happened that energized the Albanian people in 1985 when I was in Congress? What changed? You could have said, why did this happen in 1945? Why did it happen at some other time? Well, first of all, we surely said you had the worst time of communism controlling Albania from 1945 to 1990. Remember Bogosia? You couldn't get in and you couldn't get out. You shot either way. And you had Tito's communism. Not as bad, but for Albanians, it was almost as bad, because they were the unterminion of Yugoslavia. How did they get to Yugoslavia? They didn't move. The great powers did something that we're paying for today. And it was after the Balkan Wars, after World War I, someone decided that the Albanians were not really a separate race from the Slavs, and made the argument, Albanians don't forget were burning the Ottoman Empire, they didn't have the chance to get out and do their diplomacy as the Greeks and Serbs did, because they had gotten out 50 and 100 years before. So here they are, never making their case, and someone convinced the Europeans that, you know, Albanians are like the Slavs, and really half that Albania that declared its independence in 1912, when the Ottoman Empire collapsed, should really be in this new state called Yugoslavia. Yugo meaning South, Slavia meaning Slavs. 
And Yugoslavia ended up with the Slovenes, Bosnians, Croatians, Macedonians, Serbs, the Montenegrins, Magudina, you have 57 Hungarians there, and you have the 92% province, the Sofa. Eight juridical units. Okay? Very complicated place. Held together by a very charismatic communist, not as bad as ever hold his name was Tito. But when Tito died in 1980, all hell broke loose. The Serbs then saw the opportunity to reassert themselves to dominate Yugoslavia. They were already one of the dominating republics, probably the largest one in terms of people. And what you had between 1981 and 1989, and I had to say in this book, The Agony of the Sova, this was written by me, this book put together for congressional hearings because the press didn't know this, Congress didn't know it. So I had to prepare an index to show what was going on in Yugoslavia that gave the Albanians such an incentive to get out of Serbia. And between 1981 and 1989, the year that Milosevic brutally occupied the Sova, 600,000 Albanians were put through the peace processes in the Sova. It was a state of terror, a peace state like you can't believe, all documented. Now, if you had read our State Department country reports, as a congressman, I read a lot in Congress, I mean, these are the things you don't want to read off the records, or even reading the, the New York Times, that the State Department reviews every year the condition of different states, and they comment on the condition of the human rights in those states. Well, obviously, now I'm interested in the SOFA. So in 1986 and 87, I started reading the country reports in the Balkans, and I can't believe what I'm reading. The most egregious human rights violations you can think of against the Albanian people are here being reported by our own State Department. And then I'm trying to say to myself, well, we've got to do something. So I put in the first resolution in June of 1986. Since nobody knew the SOMA, and at that point, Congressman Lampros was working on a lot of other things, I decided to put it in the House and got Bob Dole, who became a friend, because when the Republicans realized I was going to win this district, they then sent in President Ford, Bush, you name it, Dole, Kemp, everybody came in and I got to know them. And I told Bob Dole, I said, I need a Senate co sponsor. And he did it. That was 1986. By 1987, when it was reintroduced every two years, Congress ceases, you have to reintroduce it. We had 57 sponsors, and I just gave the resolution to Congress and Gilman because his name's on it, with Lantos and Gilman and, 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 and Hyde, and it's wonderful. But at that point, I went to, don't forget, I'm a junior member of the minority party. The Democrats control the Congress. Now, how am I going to get traction with this issue? Well, I figured, let me play my Italian-American side. My mother was born with me, as well as my father, but he spoke the only name. So I went to Dante to sell. Why? Because I remember working with Dante on Italian-American functions when I was very actively involved with those organizations when I was in Arkansas. And I went to him and he remembered me. He said, uh, what can I do? I explained what the problem was. He said, you know, this issue's never come up. And uh, it sounds to me like we should be able to do something. You've got to go see Gus Neutron. Now, Gus was a Greek American, and he was chairman of the subcommittee for Europe and Human Rights. So I went to see Gus Neutron and got to know him. And I didn't realize that his daughter lived in North Shell, my district. So there was another connection with Gus Neutron. So, we started talking. I said, well, we should be able to do something on this. You're right, country report. So we decided to put this resolution in. And the next thing we know, it's like all hell broke loose. The State Department starts writing letters to everybody. Every 57 of those letters that signed this resolution got a letter from the other secretary. And Dante Cassell gets a four-page letter explaining why we should do nothing at this point. Because it would create more tensions. Yugoslavia has promised to to get the reform, but it surely says those reforms never came. The most of this occupies the Sova in 1989, puts a gun to the head of the assembly. The Sova was a separate juridical unit of Yugoslavia. Every eight years, the president of the Sova was now vacant. It had its own assembly. Milosevic forced the assembly to turn their power to Serbia. So in effect, there was no assembly. Congressman Lantos and I brought the assembly in exile to Luxembourg in 1991, and we kind of formed an interparliamentary group with England, the United States, and that assembly. 
Well, I think you know the rest. Between 1990, we went there in 1990, Congressman Lanto saw firsthand what that his worst fears were confirmed. I described him as a war ghetto, and he said, no, I, it's amazing that this exists today in the heart of Europe where these people are being treated. And we didn't know that. The press here wasn't covering it. Then what was going on? The war in Slovenia, 1990-91. The war in Croatia, 1992. The war in Bosnia. And what we have? Republican administration, and we have the Secretary of State saying, we don't have a dog in that fight. We must keep Yugoslavia together at all costs. And what does that do? Give the green light to Mr. Milosevic to keep going from one war to the other. And you saw what happened in Bosnia. 250,000 innocent civilians murdered in Treblinka. 8,000 young men and their fathers with them put in a barn and just shot up. Things like this. I mean, you have to go back to the Nazi era to understand this. And then I realized what was coming. Because the biggest prize for the, for, for the service was going to be the soda. And I had to step up. Thank God I didn't show you at that time. So we started to increase our lobbying efforts. We are volunteers. We formed this to help the Albanian people. We don't get paid for what we're doing. We have other professional responsibilities. But I have a, uh, a, a thing that I was waving around to my congressional friends. And, and if I have it in here, I'll show it to you because it's an important document. Here it is. We had it translated from the Cyrillic. Don't forget, the Serbs don't use the Latin alphabet like the Albanians. They use the Cyrillic. And this was translated. And I found an Albanian sent to me. And he said, you have to have this translated because this plan was written in 1937 by the ultranationalist, then academician, and then became one of the ministers in the Belgrade government. But this is March 7, 1937. Two years before Goran wrote the final solution for the Jewish people, they already had in writing how they were going to ethically cleanse the Albanian people from the soda. And if you read this, you wouldn't believe what it says. But if we can't buy their clerics, if we can't trick them, if we can't push them out, then we have to burn their house. We must get them out. Well, this is what Velocevic was reading when he walked into the soda. And in 1998, Rechak, Rechak, what did they do? Walked into houses with guns, just killed innocent civilians. Very good. We had to find out later from Ambassador Walker that there was a mass rape there. They denied it. And then we had, obviously, the worst thing that you ever visualize, a million people being put on railroad cars from Kosovo and out. And we witnessed on CNN something that we couldn't believe would exist in this century. That's how bad it got. Well, bottom line is, Milosevic was indicted for genocide, not just war crimes or human rights violations. And right now, the Albanians who have been under a protectorate from the UN since 1999, and thank God, finally, the Congress did act to push Mr. Clinton to do what Mr. Bush would do, and that would be to intervene. Not easy for the United States to intervene, but we realized that if we didn't do it at that time, there would be carnage like you can't believe based on what we saw in Bosnia. So Mr. Clinton did it. Thank God for the Jewish lobby, joining with the Albanian lobby at that point. 34 Jewish American congressmen realized that the Albanian people were not what the Serbs were saying. These were tolerant people. In fact, these are the people that saved every Jew in World War II. A predominantly Muslim population risked their lives in the read a little book that we left there in Albania. It's the only state in Europe that saved every Jew in Albania and those that were lucky to escape into uh, Albania from Western Europe and Yugoslavia. So today, we hope we get the justice for the Albanian people. Why is this important for us? Number one, we need peace and stability in Europe. It is in our vital interest. It's one of our biggest trading partners. There will be no peace and stability in Europe without settling the world in crisis, and this is a major component of that. And there are many other reasons why this is important, but think about this. Think about the Balkans, and think about the Albanian areas of the world. Kosovo, 70% unemployment. Albania, 50% unemployment. 100,000 Albanians in southern Serbia, a place called Grishev Valley, 90% unemployment. Macedonia, well over 30, 40% unemployment. 
Only remittances from the large Albanian families in Europe and America have kept those countries together at this point. The houses that were burned by the Serbs, 300,000, only 15,000 replaced by the UN. The rest were replaced mainly by European and, and, and American families, Albanian families selling money back. The other thing you should know is that the Albanians are now the youngest population in Europe. If you look at the 7 million Albanians, 3.5 Albanian, 2 million Kosovo, almost a million Macedonian, and you have Montenegro and Kresheva, you've got that 7 million, you're talking about 70% of them under 30, 50% under 25. Now, Europe doesn't want them. We don't want them. We're sending them back. We don't want them. As you know, a lot of them are illegal here. We can't wait to the border. What are we going to send them back to? As Congressman Hines said, what are we trying to do? In the hearing in 19, 2005, when he faced off with Ambassador uh, Burns, he said, are we trying to create another Gaza Strip here, this time in Europe, where these kids will have precious little to do and throw stones? We need to make this a state so they can borrow from the World Bank, the IMF, the European Bank for Reconstruction, because without the infrastructure, the electricity goes on and off, six hours, six hours on, six hours off every day in Kosovo. How do you do things? Got to get new electric plants. Got to get new roads in order to provide the environment for real investment so you can put these people to work. And that's why this independence is more than an academic issue. It's very important. Not only to Albanians and the Balkans, but to Europe and then to us. But with that, thank you. I come We got to deal with the issue. The issue today is that 92% of the soul is Albanian. And as Congressman Landau said, there is no chance that 92% who were almost exterminated by the Serbian people would now agree to be part of Serbia. And that's what the United Nations is able to do. I'll be very happy to deal with your very excellent question, because you are raising some very serious and, and substantive issues. The the question of Russian foreign policy is dramatically broader than the issue of Kosovo. Somewhere along the line, the Kremlin will have to decide whether it wishes an increasing intensity of confrontation with Western Europe and the United States, or whether it wants to have a cooperative relationship. If it is the latter, the problem will solve itself in very short order, because there is overwhelming consensus behind the plan of the Finnish former president of his side to provide the people of Kosovo, who are over 90% Albanian, with a clear path to full independence with full protection of the Serbian minority. One of the issues that I'm sure you'll be pleased to note is that during our hearing last week on this issue, um, every single member of Congress who spoke about the desirability of granting independence to the Albanians simultaneously emphasized the absolute non-negotiability of full protection to the Serbian minority. As a matter of fact, it is my view that the prime beneficiary of the Atisari plan are not the Albanians, but they are the Serbians, who today are attempting to bring under their control a population which is overwhelmingly deeply opposed to them, detest them for their recent horrific acts, and since Serbia, as all the other European nations, can find its full fruition only by joining the European Union, will never be able to join the European Union as long as it exists on dominating Kosovo with a 92% Albanian population. So the only way to open the door for Serbian membership 
in the European Union is for Kosovo to gain its independence. I have full confidence that uh, over a period of time, and it take, may take a number of months, the Serbians behind the scenes will persuade the Russians, their supporters, that it is in Serbia's interest to let the anti serbian plan proceed. As a matter of fact, there is little doubt in my mind, having been to Belgrade repeatedly in, in recent times, that privately, the Serbian leadership is fully cognizant of the fact that Kosovo independence is on its way. And since Serbia desperately wants to be part of Europe, as it should be, and part of the European Union, as it should be, they are secretly hoping that the resolution of this issue will be found. There was a time in Iraq where a dramatic escalation of military forces could have brought us an entirely different result than the one we have today. General Shinseki, the head of our army, um, five years ago, proposed that the invasion take place with several hundred thousand people because he clearly understood that while the defeat of the Iraqi army could be very fast and relatively not very costly, which in fact was the case, the occupation of the country would be dramatically more demanding, requiring vast numbers of additional troops. That solution cannot be superimposed on 2007. You cannot unscramble the omelet. Now, had there been a benign and friendly Belgrade government many years ago, offering the Albanians full autonomy, which is what you are talking about, that, that could have been a viable solution. Because in Europe, fortunately, we have at the end of the rainbow, the possibility of joining the European Union. And it would have made very little difference to the people in Pristina whether they joined the European Union having a central government in Belgrade or a government in Pristina. But given the ethnic cleansing, given the brutality, given the bloodbaths, given the rapes, given, given this unbelievable cruelty with which the Kosovars were treated, to talk about autonomy in 2007 is wholly unrealistic. So while I, I recognize your good intentions, I am merely suggesting that history moves on and some solutions which at some points could have been viewed as potentially feasible with the passage of time and with the intervening of events, very ugly events, is no longer realistic. Um, as far as Congress's uh, posture towards uh, the Kosovo situation is concerned, uh, while I can only speak for myself, it is my judgment that the overwhelming majority of my colleagues, both in the Senate and in the House, uh, will fully support the Adisari plan. The Adisari plan, which is such a rational, reasonable, modest, compromise bridge formula, uh, that I would be amazed if overwhelmingly Congress would not stand behind it. <laughs>